Well, thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, I hope that those of you who are joining us are excited about learning more about our book and to talk more with the case study authors and lead authors that we're working with today. So introduce yourselves in the chat, have a good time, and I'm gonna get started with sort of an introduction to what this book is and why we are talking about it here today with everyone. So first, what is the OER Starter Kit for Program Managers? Hopefully some of you already know if you're here today, but who knows? <laughs> uh, this book is was created to sort of bring attention to the level and breadth of work involved in building and managing an OER program. Uh, it contains 22 chapters and eight case studies, so a nice solid 30, which address different aspects of open education work, broken into seven major sections, a quick guide to open ed, building a program, program management, uh, training and professional development, supporting OER adoption, supporting open textbook creation, and collecting and reporting data on your program. So sort of going through all of the little bits and pieces that make up doing open education work at a program manager level. For a little bit of a peek behind the scenes, this book has been going on for now three years of development. Uh, in 2019, I think it was fall, we first came together with our lead authors to sort of come up with what the idea of this book would be. Uh, and we collaboratively outlined all the different sections we wanted to be in this book. Uh, I'm gonna wait a second as she joins the meeting. But Stephanie Buck was really one of the lead uh, thought leaders behind this work. Uh, and without her sort of drive for, we need to make sure to include these specific sections, I don't think it would have turned out as in-depth and as helpful resource as it is today. So huge shout out to Stephanie for being amazing. Uh, during the 2019 and 2020 years, we identified additional authors to develop case studies and put out uh, sort of the first draft of what we would be putting together. And then over 2021 and 2022, we did an open call for peer reviewers and uh, copy editors to look over the book. I think probably the biggest piece of this was the 86 peer reviewers, some of you in the chat today, uh, who were assigned to different aspects of the book to really look it over and give us feedback on what needs to be tweaked here. So it was quite a lot of people who had hands in this project and really helped to drive it into where it needed to be. Uh, I want to also shout out uh, Cheryl Casey, uh, who <laughs> cannot be here today because of other issues, uh, but she was a huge, huge lift when it came to copy editing. She has a lot of background in that work. And even during the peer review process, she caught so many little things that otherwise would have fallen through the cracks. So in 2022, during the spring, we've been working on final edits, importing to press books, working on the final formatting and design work uh, and doing the book cover for the final publication. So it's taken a couple of months, but we've finally got it all together and here is where we are. Okay, so before we get into more of the fun Q&A discussion bits, I wanna talk a little bit about how to use the book in your own work. So it was primarily developed as a reference source, uh, something you can refer to when you're thinking about approaching a new project or practice at your institution. There are a few other ways you can use it in your own practice too, like supporting training for peers and new hires or communicating what is the scope of your work to an administrator or supervisor who might not understand. Oh, here's a 30 chapter book about the level of work that I'm doing, guys. This might help you. <laughs> But there's a lot of different ways to potentially use the book in your own work. And so what I'd like to ask you all now is, what's another way you hope to use this book in your professional practice? Feel free to raise your hand if you'd rather unmute or to post it in the chat. Amanda. Hi, I'm really looking forward to being able to incorporate it into professional development um, activities for um, folks who are starting to do this work. So I developed a course for KPU that sort of does an introduction to how to support folks who are doing open education work. Um, and I would love to, I would love to add it as a resource to that course to start with.
That's a great idea. I've heard of folks uh, maybe uh, adding this book to lib guides, um, trying to, again, orient um, people who are maybe new to this type of work. Again, it doesn't need to be um, someone who is a sole program manager, but someone who might be involved in these efforts. Um, there's a lot of sections on teams in the different interdepartmental roles that help make a OER initiative, an OER initiative successful. So love that you're already incorporating it into the KPU course. Um, and Vahid says they are um, looking forward to recommending the book or extracts of the book to organizations that want to foster the creation of OER. Um, I love that we're thinking beyond the typical college or institution. So uh, they are thinking about ministries of education, NGOs, and so on. Jeff, is there more that is coming in into the chat that you'd like to highlight? Uh, well, the next one was about, uh, so this was from Stephanie Fletcher saying that she's entering the second semester of running a new OER program. Well, welcome. Um, and hopes to use this both as a resource for herself, uh, but also for the faculty who partner with her to promote OER on campus. I think that's a really good point, like involving what I would call your champions, uh, which others call advocates, et cetera. I think that's really cool. Also, if you're if you're new to the OER programs, contact us if you have any questions too. Uh, we, we'd be glad to help. Getting other ideas to improve the OER initiative, yeah. Uh, using it to view OER program through different perspectives, neat. Uh, Paul says, shared as a resource in my institution, but shared with all participants in an online Caribbean-wide course on online learning. That's really neat. Yeah, if there are folks you know that are thinking about different ways that they can get invested or interested in ways to support online and distance learning and supporting other kinds of work that's related to open ed, it might be useful to share a guideline like this uh, or a guidebook like this to help them think about, oh, this ties directly into OER or the work we're already doing could be partly related to OER as well. We could partner with you on making this sort of a broader initiative that supports multiple things. Like all of you with your great ideas. Okay, so Moving on, I want to get to the next slide just to give people a little bit of a chance to learn from our chapter and case study authors about what do you most want readers to take away from your contributions to the book? So is there something that you think is particularly noteworthy that you'd like them to see or to learn from? Is there something that uh, a chapter that you contributed to that you're particularly proud of? Or perhaps for the case study authors, a takeaway from your case study that you think oh, this is something I really hope that people get out of this when they're reading through it or can think about. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Regina Gong. I am the OER and Student Success Librarian at Michigan State. And one of the um, case study authors in this awesome OER. So thank you everyone for, for attending this launch party. Um, so my case study is um, in the chapter on building an OER program. And it speaks to my experience running an OER program in a community college and now at um, a land grant R1 University. And I think what, what I want uh, readers to not really take away, right? But to, to just understand is the experience of running an OER initiative by librarians that are not really represented in the open space. So my perspective as a woman, as a woman of color um, running an OER initiative, and also that often not talk about subject of labor, um, most especially invisible labor that comes with doing this, this kind of work. And so hopefully, you know, when you 
when you read this case study and my experience, um, it actually um, inspires you and also um, makes you think about even as we um, run it out of our passion, out of our commitment, sometimes if the institution is not willing to support the work, the work of the most passionate librarian or advocate in this field will not be successful. So that's, that's all. Thanks. Well, I did a lot of the uh, data analysis and reporting stuff at the end. And I think the big takeaway from it is that you can do it. Uh, it, even if you don't have a background in data analysis, I sure didn't when I first got started. Um, there are some things that you can do uh, to get your OER program started on the, on the right foot in collecting that data and being able to answer the big questions that will come at you. Uh, they are, it, it's meant to be absolutely not imposing and shout outs to the peer reviewers who pointed out like the ways in which things could be like configured to be more educational, like more process oriented. So you'll see step-by-step -step stuff in those chapters. And the reason why it's step-by-step -step is that the peer reviewers noticed that I was doing a little bit of it, but not enough. So I've brought it all together into that framework to make it more of a like entire process step-by-step -step thing. Uh, so. Yeah, uh, it's it's absolutely doable work for sure. And yes, thank you, Regina. That is such a cool case study. Yeah, I want to while we're here, shout out one person in the chat, uh, Don Lowe Winsonson, uh, who shared, uh, I hope people take away that innovation is wonderful and OER is fantastic, but to plan uh, when your innovation succeeds. Uh, her case study uh, three, building a roller coaster while writing it, <laughs> was one that uh, really goes into what can happen when things just start running and you have to build as you're going along and make it work and how that can be a major issue that a lot of OER program managers run into. Uh, she shares, this advice is something I call to mind when thinking of how to start an OER program at the institution I've moved to since writing the case study. So that's great to hear about. Anyone else have anything they'd like to share from their contributions and sections? Just want to make this audible from the chat. Uh, Judith Sebesta just shared that uh, the Open Texas Conference is coming up. They are looking for proposals, and the theme is the labor of open education. So if anyone's interested in that, uh, she has the link in the chat. So uh, we wrote the chapter, the case study on man using Manifold, um, and we were hoping to give a sense of both um, what kinds of projects could be possible on, a plat on Manifold or on a platform like Manifold, um, what kinds of um, you know, teaching and learning can be supported. Um, so we, we went through a lot of case studies, uh, but also um, what kind of work is involved in supporting this kind of project um, from a case study, uh, from a project manager position, and what kinds of pitfalls um, can can get in the way. Because um, I think, yeah, if you're prepared for them, then they won't get in the way of the cool things that you can do. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Christina. It was really cool seeing the Manifold chapter sort of evolve as the edits for it came together. Uh, it's a great example of all the different things you can do in, with one type of tool, and that's built out more throughout the section on publishing and supporting the publication of OER, so people can think about what does it take to make a textbook and what are the different options available for making that process work. So uh, I'll shout out Aperva here <laughs> as 
uh, an amazing contribution to that, uh, of course, with her experience uh, with the textbook program through the Rebus community and Stephanie for all of her work, really leading the second half of the books uh, sections and making that come together. I'm hoping that um, at least with the chapters that um, I've authored on uh, project management, folks will walk away with some reassurance that you don't need to have all of the answers right away. You don't need to have all of the systems and tools figured out right away, but um, there's a lot of learning as you go with this work. And there is a network and community of support um, available to you, even if you are the only person trying to um, bolster these efforts on your campus, at your organization, in your region. Um, there is a lot of work that you can build off of. So you'll see Stephanie um, and I point to existing resources and templates that you can adapt and sort of reuse as you need. Um, but there's also um, information about um, listservs that you can tap into or um, ways to build a support network to help you reach your strategic goals and help you um, um, get your program um, uh, to where you want it to be. So that's something I hope you'll walk away with. You don't need to know everything right now, but use this resource, use that particular chapter on project management to, to learn and build. And I'm wondering, Abby, would you um, mind maybe screen sharing just the book? And um, I know you talked about the seven different parts, but we can also show folks who are here and who maybe haven't been part of um, building or contributing what's covered in each of the parts, what the different case studies, um, what perspectives those case studies shed light on, um, and how they can even think about you know, switching in and looking at Jeff's sections on collecting and reporting data or Marco's sections on uh, course conversions. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, can you see it right now or is it stuck in the presenting view? Okay. Yeah, we can see it. I never know with Google Slides if it's just deciding that it's going to take over the whole screen. I'll hang around uh, in the second lower section over here, and if we have someone speak up, I'll hop into theirs. <laughs> well, I guess, okay, I've been talking so much, but I haven't actually talked about the sections that I wrote, so I guess I should say something. Uh, so I wrote uh, a few of the chapters in the beginning of the book about sort of getting started, learning more about OER and building out your team and getting started with everything on campus. Uh, and I think one of the takeaways that I feel like I say this every time I present to someone, but the biggest takeaway I have uh, that I'd like for people to learn from this is that you should never build something from scratch if you can borrow it from somewhere else. So if there are existing templates, if there are existing examples that you can build off of and learn from, then reach out to people and get their help, even if that means it's not someone at your institution, it could be someone on an OER listserv, it could be someone on social media who you're looking up to as an aspirational person in the space. It is always nice to at least reach out and see what they can do for you or if they can share something, because you never know if maybe they actually have a, a whole Google folder of templates that they can just send on to you and say, do with this what you will. It would be nice if that were always the case, but it is often the case in the open movement because that is what this is all about, is sharing things and learning from one another and building up on what came before. So as you're thinking about sort of how you can get started with all of this, it's good to think about where people have already done the work. And I think that's really well seen in Jeff and I's chapter from that we adapt, adapted from the Spark Open Education Leadership Program, uh, their Open Education Primer, uh, <laughs> which I also helped write originally. So it's a whole full circle sort of deal. Uh, but this looks into all the different pieces that can be part of an open education program from workshops and uh, 
review programs, grant programs, and all the different little pieces that make up your open education work. And then looking at who's done this before, how did they make it work and what are the best practices? I did want to mention uh, Amy Hofer's case study. She's not able to be here today. She works for Open Oregon Educational Resources. She's the director there. Um, she has a case study in the data section that's really cool. It's kind of an actionable look at what she's done throughout the state of Oregon. Um, and the kind of philosophy behind coming up with an estimate per uh, resource, she visualizes the kind of data philosophy stuff in quadrants. Uh, she's really good at that, at that visual aspect of things. So you'll see the quadrants there, and then you'll see exactly where all of the stuff fits into it. And it's really neat. And she's very honest about it too. She's like, here's where I think it's messy, but it's supposed to be. Here's where things can be cleaned up. Here's uh, what depends on each institution. Here's something that's more of a global idea. Uh, so it's, it's really, it's a neat one. So if you look at my chapters, absolutely look at um, Amy's case study because it's a really awesome take. Well, if we're doing shout outs, I definitely want to shout out Marco Cipherle Valencia, who is one of the, um, I guess, uh, five editors um, of this resource. Um, Hopefully Marco will be able to join for a brief portion of this launch, but uh, his chapter on um, supporting OER conversion, building familiarity, they're all really excellent. And um, maybe Abby, as you're scrolling, um, it's worth noting a few, what I think are really interesting features, not only about this chapter, but, but the book overall. Um, we're really trying to tackle things like misconceptions about this work. And as Regina was describing, um, bringing to the surface a lot of the behind the scenes labor that goes into um, a successful program or a successful project. Um, so you'll see Marco talking all about whether it's project management and time, but um, the different um, stages of course conversion work and different ways in which it can happen um, at an institution. Uh, I really appreciated the intentionality with which um, Marco discussed doing this work equitably. Um, not only is it a part of this chapter, but it was a key part of our conversations as um, a project team, as we were discussing ideas around um, the book, discussing chapters, discussing even workflows and processes. Um, so that's something I'm hoping you will be able to find, not just in this chapter, but throughout the book, is um, a calling to reflect also on how you can make um, your programs, your practices, your work more equitable. Yeah, I co-authored the um, Building Familiarity on Campus chapter with Marco, and the perspective he brings towards doing things very intentionally on a campus are extremely unique, not, not something that I would be able to present as someone who does system-wide work. So I talk about the environmental skin stuff and how to do it, but when it comes to like, here are the types of people you will encounter on campus, here's what kind of message you can bring to them, the OER audiences, that's Marco, and he does uh, an excellent job there uh, of uh, distinguishing groups that, you know, you can't generalize them to the whole. Uh, talk about assemblage theory and all that stuff. But what you can do is start customizing your messages towards those people. Because like uh, both Abby and Apoorva have said, it's about the stuff that's already been done and just kind of building on that. We've all encountered various types of audiences and people who are either extremely receptive to the idea of OER, they're already doing it, which is amazing, and then you can get them to uh, do even more and even be leaders, um, and those who may completely reject it too. Um, if you're very new to this, this may suddenly come as a surprise when you hear these kinds of types of responses, but Marco's really set up a nice framework here for how to tell your messaging 
based on who it is that you're talking to. Yeah, this is a lovely chapter, and I do want to point out, because we didn't say it before now, but if you haven't had a chance to delve into the book, there are sections that we made sure to include in every single chapter, uh, apart from the case studies, which included a conclusion, sort of wrapping it up, recommended resources, which are links out to things that we think might be useful for you if you're interested in the topic of that chapter. That might be a book, it might be a chapter, an article, it might be a worksheet or a resource that you can utilize in your own program really depends on the chapter. And then key takeaways regarding sort of what's been talked about and what are some things that we wanna make sure really resonate with you that you can come back to and look at this chapter in a new light after thinking through what's the big picture here. So are there any other case study authors in the field or any other lead authors? I know, Stephanie, you haven't said anything yet. We've talked about you a lot, but. Um, I guess I would say that I hope that the book is useful for somebody who's really new to this and feels like they're doing it alone and that they don't need to do it alone. Um, this is a lot of what we put into this book was our experiences so that we suffered so you don't have to kind of thing. Um, not quite, but, you know, we, we did it because uh, we, or we, we worked on it and we share our experiences with you so that you can learn from what we did and maybe what we, we should not have done. So I hope that people will really enjoy using this manual. Well said. Yeah, uh, I will say I uh, appreciate especially the sustaining OER projects chapter that Stephanie put together. It really goes into sort of what it takes to make sure things keep moving forward and how you can continue to support not just the funding, but also the overarching making sure things keep moving, <laughs> uh, both for use and reuse of materials, making them findable, making sure that people are still invested in moving forward. Uh, and I absolutely adore the technical side of things that maybe are not at, always at the front of my mind, but that Stephanie really brought home throughout the book. All right. Well, we'll come back to this little book show and tell in a little bit, but for now, let's head back to our presentation and the next section, which is for you, the audience, what section of the book were you most excited to find? So if, as we've been looking through it, as we've been thinking about the chapters and doing a bit of show and tell, or even if you've been reading it in the week up till now, uh, is there a specific chapter or piece of content or a section that you found particularly exciting to think this exists now? Judith says collecting and reporting data. Yeah, Jeff did a wonderful job there. <laughs> I'm excited for all of it. Uh, building a grant program, since that's what we're about to try and put together. Yeah. I'll say it's kind of funny uh, in my side of things because the section I was most excited to see completed uh, and out in the world is one that I wrote. 
uh, but it's in the first chapter about uh, OER talking about remix projects and different kinds of remixes that people can do, whether it means you're adapting a piece of work or pulling together multiple things into one new thing, because it's a question I see a lot coming up on listservs from people that are new to this. And I was excited to just finally have a section I could point to and say, there it is. I don't have to remember how I explained this last time. It's in a book. Uh, so that was very fun for me. Uh, Pamela shares, uh, I'll show, share the manual and OER presentations with faculty librarians working on affordable learning initiatives. Thank you. And Suzanne notes that they are um, grateful that the book will serve as a framework for discussions as they're moving from a state funded OER grant um, to more of a um, 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 funded um, grant program that they're going to build. And Ryer notes that um, they like the pieces, the very practical pieces of the book on hosting or data collection or project management and marketing. Yes, yeah, as, as we were putting together the outline, we noticed that there are so many puzzle pieces to this work that don't often get talked about. Um, I know Stephanie and I looked at, you know, the project management for instructional designers book, but there wasn't really one for um, OER projects. So we reached out to others we know uh, who had done this work. So Anita Waltz shared some of her lessons. Elaine Thornton um, um, asked us to look at some resources as well. Um, and I just, you know, while folks are thinking and dropping more ideas uh, into the chat, I just wanted to flag a note that Marco uh, Saifale Valencia, one of the editors of the book, um, has joined. So we'll just pause and give Marco a round of applause for their contributions, uh, his contributions to the book as well. And welcome, Marco. Oh, thank you, Approva. That is too kind. Can you all hear me right now? I never know if my... Yes, uh... we can hear you. You just missed us talking uh, very excitedly about how much we love all your chapters and how like picking apart part our favorite things about your collaboration with Jeff and your own other chapter and all the cool things that you brought that we didn't expect anyone to include. Uh, sadly, but there will be a recording so you can re watch it afterwards and see how we talk about you when you're not here. <laughs> And I feel like I just lost your audio, Marco. <laughs> Try talking for us one more time. Let's try that now. Can you hear me? There you go. OK, perfect. I, uh, I'm one of those folks who's resisted the uh... We lost you again, Marco. Yeah. <laughs> Post it in the chat. We'll read it out for you. Kelsey notes that they are excited um, about the building the roller coaster while riding it chapter, building the plane while flying it. A lot of different metaphors would work to describe the experience. Um, and uh, I know, Jeff, you've been having a conversation with Leo about how uh, perhaps given the roles of a lot of us as contributors and authors of the book, um, we tend to be maybe more focused on the regions in which we work, which happens to be US and, and Canada for the most part, but um, we would definitely love perspectives um, outside of North America because the education systems in different parts of the world are so different. Do you want to tell us a little more about that discussion? Well, yeah, I mean, if you're reading this and you're coming from uh, any other place than the United States, you might have a very different take on the price of textbooks and things like that. For example, um, 
I went, I, I once presented to uh, folks in Paris about our program and it's a different kind of message there when they're thinking about open education. They want to share their culture. They want to share their ideas. Um, it's, it's helpful for them to help people outside of their region. But when it comes to textbook affordability, it's not really a big thing. Uh, the stuff is priced differently there. It is subsidized in a different way there. Uh, so what I usually talk about with data didn't really make much sense. So I had to kind of shift it in that way. So I think uh, contributions from people who are outside of North America would really help uh, in building and uh, improving instructional resources like this. For sure. I think that was the one thing that at the end of the process, I thought, oh, I wish we'd done this originally, which was an open call for case study chapters and an open call for uh, co-authors. But then I feel like we'd have a 56 chapter book. <laughs> so pros, cons. Uh, but definitely there's room for improvement and even more inclusion and in whatever comes next. <laughs> yeah, maybe volume two, we'll see. I think after three years working on this book, uh, the lead authors especially could, could stand to take a short break from book level projects. Thank you, Kara. Yeah, uh, I've been very used to managing projects where other faculty are writing open textbooks and that's really cool. But now authoring chapters of it and going through the peer review process and then revising based on uh, peer review recommendations, doing the copy editing, like that stuff we do with the University of North Georgia Press and being on the other side of that is eye opening. Like it, is, it, it takes a lot of time. <laughs> oh, yep. And yeah, Leo's talking about the cost of textbooks has become a much bigger issue during the pandemic. Libraries were needed to oh, buy access to ebooks, and there was a massive increase in need. Publishers jacked up the prices. Oh, that's an ebook thing. Yeah, the oh boy. Uh, thank you, Leo, for mentioning the ebook yeah. SOS issue. Uh, if you want to talk about it on Twitter, it is hashtag ebook SOS, but there's a lot going on with regard to libraries being asked to uh, purchase ebook collections or unlimited user ebooks, which are often incredibly expensive compared to their traditional textbook counterparts uh, in order to fulfill a class's needs, uh, and in some cases not even having the ability to order them. It's another aspect of this whole ecosystem we live in. <laughs> It definitely is. Um, and, you know, I'm going to say, uh, as uh, Dr. Apple was asking in the chat, um, you can browse through the different sections of the book um, online. You can also download it in a variety of different formats for you to read. But I might segue us maybe to the, the next section of, of um, our hour together um, and rely on Judith and Amanda to do that. So Judith flagged in the chat that, you know, for her, um, this book is just so validating and it's proof that many of us are grappling with the same challenges um, and some creative and innovative solutions to meet these challenges that she's seeing a lot of those um, ideas in the book throughout. Um, so if you have questions, if you have challenges, now is your time to ask it. Um, and Amanda asks in the chat, um, Abby, how does it feel to have gone from the OER starter kit, which is an excellent guide that I would recommend to all of you, um, to the workbook that was co-authored with Stacey Katz, who uh, is on the call, um, to this larger iteration for a slightly different audience? Post a link for those who don't know about the original starter kit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's it's been weird, uh, in part because of the difference in coordination across the three. Uh, so when I did the original OER starter kit, the idea was to put together a very short, easy handbook for faculty that need help getting started with OER, but don't have someone like me to help them through it and just need like some sort of structure to figure out what they're doing. 
Uh, and so I did it a lot on the weekends by myself over the summer, whenever I had free time. And it all sort of sort of came together. No one else knew I was working on it. There was no rush. Uh, and then doing the workbook with uh, Stacy, it was a little bit more structured. It was working alongside someone else, divvying up who's working on which chapters, what we're creating, what the purpose is of the worksheets, and how to create them in a way that's sustainable for sharing over time. And then the starter kit for program managers is just that times two, where all of a sudden uh, I'm editing this book with all these co-authors and coordinating the assignments of chapters to peer reviewers. Uh, I put together the, I taught myself Adobe Illustrator so I could make the book cover <laughs> and uh, did a lot of CSS in the back end of the press book to make sure that the colors lined up across all the different exports. Uh, but in the end, it's a really exciting sort of through line to see what it takes to go from being someone who's just casually interested in doing OER work and what you can get out of it through the starter kit to partnering with more people and leveraging really the open movement and open call for peer reviewers and call for copy editors. You can do something much bigger and more impactful by asking for help. Who knew? <laughs> so that's really what the takeaway for me has been. Well, if anyone has other questions for Abby, for us, for any of the case study authors or others as they're planning to maybe use this book in, in different ways, feel free to unmute, uh, ask away, or post your question in the chat. Yes, I highly recommend asking other people questions. I feel like I've gotten too much attention today so far. Fire up, are there any chapters, sections, um, or advice on preparing an OER program to sustain after a program manager leaves? And I might pass that over to Stephanie to, to give us some initial thoughts. Well, that's an, an excellent question. And I think a lot of that has to do with planning um, about where we are, where you are in the process. And how your program is funded, um, whether it's something that's really depending on one person or whether there's an institutional support for it. So we didn't really discuss that specifically, I don't think, in the, in the text, but we did talk about sustaining a program and we talk about how you can make sure that your program keeps going um, so I would say you probably want to think about finding somebody to manage your program, uh, even if they're, once somebody else leaves, just because it's an, it's not something that's just going to happen by itself. It needs somebody to, to it needs some TLC, it needs somebody to, to monitor and take care of it. Um, but I, I'm open to other suggestions from other folks who've been in that situation. I might also um, suggest looking at the uh, sections of the book that talk about um, building um, the program and specifically Abby's chapter on building your team, because I think that can then signal to, again, the many hands involved in sustaining this work rather than it just being um, an initiative that runs on the expertise and sweat and all the rest of just one person. Um, making sure that this is um, a sustainable program can also mean, again, uh, ensuring that there are multiple people involved. So one person leaving doesn't cause the whole machine to stop. And I've also put in the link to um, a conversation um, focused more on what happens when your author leaves, what happens when your um, subject matter expert, faculty or instructor who's authored a book um, leaves the institution. So the Open Education Network and Rebus community will be exploring that conversation a bit more on Thursdays. 
So if you're thinking about, well, maybe I can solve this problem at the smaller scale of a single project and then work backwards to see how some of those strategies and suggestions could be applied program wide. Please jump in, Paul. It looks like you have a comment or a question. Hi, thank you very much. I I, I told my my good friend Gabriel coming from for you the comments that your book was one of the greatest things that I've seen for the for the year. So I'm I'm looking forward to to using it. Um, I welcome the idea of a of a volume two. Uh, where you read their contributions from outside uh, North America. And I'm hoping that by that time, I'll be able to write about the Caribbean story because we're in an area where OER is still either relatively new or relatively unknown and their pockets are everywhere. I'm hoping to bring that all together to create a kind of an OER um, Caribbean movement. So I do hope that by the time they get around to, or maybe when they want some feedback, on your toolkit that I can share um, our, our story with you. And hopefully that will help to inspire other areas, other pockets where uh, OER is new or, or not as, as, uh, as popular. So I thank you for your effort. I think it's a really wonderful work. I haven't looked at a lot of it, but just looking at the contents alone, I am, I am thrilled. I'm very pleased. I commend you all for your work. And like I said, I hope you'll provide you some positive feedback on how we applied it in, in our area. Thanks again. And thank you for inviting us to participate in your launch today. Thank you. That was wonderful, Paul. And we look forward to seeing whatever you do next, uh, wherever it comes out. And if we do decide to put together a call for other people, I think if I were involved in something like that, I would stay at the editor level and not write anything because I do want to make sure that I'm not the only voice doing a lot of this, especially if it's focused on elsewhere. Uh, but it's an exciting possibility. Oh boy, you guys get me excited about projects I could do when I just finished this one. But uh, any very other- glad, Very glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, no, it sounds wonderful. Is there any other questions about things, whether they're in the book, if you're not sure, uh, things that you read in the book that you have questions about more, uh, general questions? <laughs> Carrie's wondering if there are tips for advocating for full-time or dedicated positions either in or outside of libraries. Um, and uh, they know it can vary by institution, but it's an important piece of sustainability. And it sounds like um, one of the wonderful Amandas in the OER world has a collection of job descriptions going already that has been extremely helpful, but is there more in the book that um, could help Carrie? Sadly, I did not get a chance to build this out too much. Uh, Amanda Larson, shout out to you. Uh, feel free to post your Google Drive in the chat if you want to, with all the job descriptions you've saved over the years. Uh, but it, we're covered, we covered a little bit in the case study, specifically Cheryl's and Regina's when it comes to what it's like being an OER librarian, an OER lead, how that can be structured in different institutions. Uh, and then when talking about building your team, uh, we talk a little bit about the different structures that can be built around that, whether you're a full time or part time person and what that looks like. I will uh, say the uh, OER of Skullcom, which is a Skullcom book coming out soonish, we'll find out. Uh, that's for people learning more about uh, scholarly communication topics in libraries published by ACRL, I believe, uh, will have a section on OER librarianship and the practice related to that. Again, I think that is, um, there, there are different sections done by Regina, me, and Amanda Larson. So we're all the same people <laughs> writing about it again. Uh, but specifically the idea of part-time, full-time is not dressed, I think, in the starter kit itself.
All right, so we've only got a few minutes left. So, oh boy, <laughs> as I say that. Leo has something to share if you'd like to look in the chat, uh, but there's specifically uh, a survey out about institutional policy supporting OE open education. So if you'd like to help Leo with his research, uh, please feel free to fill that out for him. So the final thing here is how can you get involved uh, moving forward with the book? Uh, first is by looking at our page in the Rebus community, uh, following the book, talking the discussion boards. There's space for you to sort of meet up with other people who are working off of this and thinking about what's missing and what questions they have and talking with other people in the community. Uh, you can share your thoughts with us using the feedback form in the book's back matter, uh, which will send me an email as soon as someone fills something out. So. <laughs> If, if you see a typo, if you see a section that's missing a very key component, do let me know and we can get those uh, fixed up. And spread the word about the book using hashtag OER Starter Kit PM if you are still on Twitter. Uh, since we planned this book launch, things have gotten weird over there, but still, some of you are still on there, I know. Yeah, and you'll see on the book um, homepage that we have an active call there to join what we're calling this community of practice. Um, different people are going to be using the book or learning from the book or perhaps have ideas to expand and adapt and remix the book in a number of ways. Um, that's all part of practicing um, the ideas or implementing the suggestions that are in the book. So we'd love to hear from you. We'd love you to be able to connect with one another as well. So you can um, follow along on that project page or use the discussion board and the threads there in whatever ways you think will serve you best. So feel free to, whether it's share links to studies that you have ongoing or ask questions um, uh, to help address challenges that you're facing or to just share milestones of accomplishments that you've been proud of as you've been establishing yourself as a program manager and setting up your initiative. All right, well, we've got five minutes left. Any closing thoughts from any of the authors, case study authors or audience members here today? Um, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate working with Abby and the team on this book. Um, Abby did a lot of work to keep us going and it's been a really interesting experience and I encourage everybody to consider contributing to our volume two if we have one or volume three, whatever that happens to be, uh, because the more the merrier. Um, and everybody's got their perspective and and your your experience is important to share because we can all learn from it. So I'm, I'm hoping that everybody will will participate. Yeah, here, here. Thank you to Abby for spearheading this uh, particular project. Um, on my end, special thanks to Elaine Thornton for um, recommending me um, to, to step in as an author and also the um, fellow copy editors, folks who involved, uh, who helped doing this book with uh, 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 and I think Abby tried to articulate in the first slide there. So um, thank you. And I hope that this is useful in some ways and um, that um, you reuse and you let us know how you end up implementing and using either sections of, of this resource or in full. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming today. It's been great to sort of talk with you all about our book and where it's going from here, potentially <laughs> a lot of discussions about the future, which is great. Uh, but we appreciate all of your support and potential adoptions in the future for seeing where this book goes next. Thanks everybody for being here. And thanks so much, thanks so much Abby, for coordinating all of this.